Good morning, everyone. So my name is Leanne Roach, and I'm currently seconded from the Department of Agriculture here in Ireland to the Clean Water Unit with DG Environment with the European Commission. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the EPA for inviting me to speak with you today and for giving me this opportunity to update you on water policies in the European Commission. So just to give you the presentation overview, I will start with water policy in the EU. I will then discuss the current state of play of EU waters and I'll, I'll discuss surface water and groundwater. I'll then go into the fitness check of the Water Framework Directive, the CAP post 2020, and I'll then move into the European Green Deal where I focus on the biodiversity strategy and the farm to fork strategy. So first of all, for water policy in the EU, I'm sure many of you are well aware, but just an overview for those who are not. The Water Framework Directive aims to protect all surface water and groundwater bodies, including transitional and coastal waters. And this covers all pressures and impacts on waters. The objectives of this are to have no deterioration and to achieve good ecological and chemical status by 2015. This also includes good quantitative status of groundwaters by 2015. There are exemptions in place currently, and these will expire in 2027. So 2027 is our ultimate deadline for achieving the good status of all waters. And just the diagram here on the right hand side, you can see a river and its watershed or its catchment. And as you can see from this diagram, it's very complex. So we have our river and its tributaries and we can see forestry, you can see agriculture, you can see industry, you can see households. There's a lot going on. So it's a very complex directive. So where is our waters currently? So here I'm focusing on surface waters and I'm gonna show you two graphs. So the one on the left is our ecological status. There's a couple of different bars. So the first two here is for all surface waters and then it's rivers, lakes, transitional and coastal. But if I can just bring your attention back to these first two graphs, so this is all of our surface waters. The one to the left is from the first river basin management plan. And then the second bar is from the second river basin management plan. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is the gray. So the gray bar in both of these is the unknown status. So this is what's not monitored. And we can see this is significantly reduced. So we know more now. So this is a really good story. The monitoring is improving and we know more about the status of our waters. However, as we can see, the blue here is our high status, the green is good status, and then as I said, the grey is unknown, everything else is below good status. So overall here, 40% of surface water bodies are in good status. So we have a lot of work to do to try and improve that. If we look at our chemical status, so this is the graph here to the right hand side, here we only have 38% in good status. So for our surface waters, there's a lot of work that we need to do to get these into good status and achieve these 2027 deadlines. The pressures or the main pressures that are on our surface waters is hydromorphological, diffuse source pollution, which is mainly nitrates and pesticides from agriculture, and also point source pollution. So that there's a couple of different pressures that are causing this. If we look at groundwater then, this is a better story. So we have a higher proportion that's in good status. The graph here on our left is our groundwater quantitative status. And we can see that there's 89% in good status. So we have about nine or 10% there that's in less than good. Not so bad, still a little bit of work to do. If we move on to our groundwater chemical status, then we can see we've 74% in good status and approximately 25% in less than good. So overall our groundwater is in a better state than our surface water, but we still have a lot of work to do. If we look at the pressures on our groundwater then, agriculture is the main pressure through pollution from nitrates and pesticides, which is, which is the similar cause in our surface waters for our diffuse pollution. Okay, so that's the overall view of where our water is sitting right now um, and the water policy, but is our water framework directive still fit for purpose? So last year we had the fitness check of the water framework directive to find this exact question out. So the goal for assessing this, we looked at effectiveness. So is it still performing as we expected it to? Efficiency, are the costs justified given the benefits that we are achieving? The coherence, so is the water framework directive coherent with the wider EU policy? The relevance, are the objectives that we have in here still relevant today as they were when this was first developed? And finally, EU added value. So the additional value from the directive. So this is the overall goal of what we wanted to assess. The methodology then of how we did that. So we had a literature review, ongoing and recent studies, stakeholder consultations, and also a public consultation. So this was the overall methodology of how we did it. And to have a quick overall conclusion, 
is that the Water Framework Directive is broadly fit for purpose with scope for some minor improvements. So overall, yes, it's still fit for purpose today. Okay, so as I'm working on agriculture and a lot of this presentation is focused, I wanted to take out the important points of the fitness check for agriculture. So the public consultation showed agriculture with the highest rate of incoherent replies. And there is often a lack of cooperation between the agriculture and the water authorities in member states. And the integration of agricultural and water policy processes at the member state level has often been unsuccessful. And this is really, really important, this collaboration and this communication between all the different authorities. I know in Ireland, this is actually quite good, but perhaps we can make it even better. And, and it's something that's very important moving forward for achieving all of these objectives, particularly when agriculture is one of the biggest impacts. We need agriculture and the environment authorities to work together. Secondly, then, agriculture is one of the main pressures on water quality and quantity. I'm sure I don't need to remind many of you of this. The main legal interaction is with the cap in terms of agriculture. Uh, and in terms of the cap, the Water Framework Directive has helped facilitate the integration of water issues in the cap. So in order for farmers to receive their direct payments from the cap, they have to comply with cross compliance and there are Water Framework Directive requirements in here. A good level of consistency between the rural development programs and the river basin management plans is needed. So our rural development programs are developed with the agri authorities and the river basin management plans developed with the environmental authorities. So they need, there needs to be a collaboration and communication between all of these authorities to ensure that these can be consistent. I think again in Ireland this is at quite a good level and perhaps we can improve it even further but there are other member states where this is a, a huge challenge so we need to appreciate that we have a, go a good hold on this in Ireland. And the strategic plans of the CAP are offering an important tool for further integration. So these, I will have some slides on the new CAP and I'll be able to discuss this further. Okay, so just some overall information from the fitness check. So overall our water deterioration has halted and we have 40% of surface water bodies and 74% of groundwater bodies in good status. So as I've already mentioned, we still have some work to do to achieve the objectives by 2027. There has been significant progress in reducing pressures. Yes, we need to work further, but we need to appreciate that we have done progress so far. We have better monitoring and more transparent information. And you know, as we've seen from that graph showing that the gray bar showing us the unknown status has reduced, we know more now and the monitoring is getting better. This, this is really good. And there's more integrated water management in place and significant investments have been made. So, so there are positives to focus on. We don't always have to focus on the negatives. Okay, however, there is slower progress than expected. So 2027 is not so far away, just under seven years away, and we have a lot to achieve in order to meet these objectives. We know that we have long-standing problems. We're well aware of this agriculture, hydromorphology, persistent chemicals, and we need to work together to try and achieve the objectives and reduce the pressures from these. There's uneven implementation and uneven monitoring. So the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, this needs to be enforced, it needs to happen better. Um, I've mentioned a lot of long-standing problems that we're trying to come to terms with, but there's also new problems coming at us um, in the interim, so such as pharmaceuticals, microplastics, climate change, and we need to be able to adapt to deal with all of these as well. So as well as dealing with the long-standing problems we have, that we're well able to deal with the new problems that are going to come to us. Um, finally, the price for water is still not right, so you know that, that water pricing needs to be improved and overall the legislation could be more efficient. So there's some positives and negatives, but overall we do have some work to do. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the Common Agricultural Policy and just give you some slides on this. So the CAP post-2020, um, this was started in 2018 where the legislative proposals were presented. There was nine specific objectives, and I've took out the three that are most important in terms of climate and environment. And these are contributing to climate change mitigation and adaptation, as well as sustainable energy. And this one is particularly for water quantity in that climate change mitigation and adaptation point. And the next two are more for, for quality and quantity. So fostering sustainable development and efficient management of natural resources, such as water, soil and air, and contributing to the protection of biodiversity, enhancing ecosystem services and preserving habitats and landscapes. There will also be an improved system of conditions to be met by farmers. So the conditionality within the, the cross compliance, so there will be more requirements of farmers and a set of voluntary tools to be offered to farmers. So voluntary measures on top of what's mandatory for them. Okay, 
So the new green architecture is what we've proposed for CAP post-2020. So this slide on the left-hand side is showing you the current CAP that we have. So at the bottom, what is mandatory for farmers in order to receive their payments is cross-compliance. So this is environment and climate measures that farmers must comply with in order to achieve their payment. And there's also greening, which is the crop diversification requirement. And both of these are mandatory. On top of this, then we have the climate and environment measures in pillar two. So this is basically our rural development program. And this is voluntary for farmers. They, they can opt into this if they want, but they don't have to. The new cap, what it has here on pillar one is a new enhanced conditionality. So there's more requirements in terms of climate and environment that farmers must do. So farmers must do more. Um, the greening is subsided into this as well. And then also in pillar one, we have what's known as these new eco schemes. Um, so these are new schemes that are for environment and climate that will be in pillar one. And the funding for these will also come from the overall pillar one budget. So the percentage of the overall pillar one budget will be in these eco schemes. And if farmers want to achieve the full payment that they normally would do, they need to opt into these eco schemes. And then the pillar two or the rural development program, that stays the same, these voluntary measures that farmers have. Okay, so another requirement is the CAP strategic plan. Member states are required to develop a CAP strategic plan, which encompasses both pillars. Then within this, then there, it includes a SWOT analysis, so the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Following on from this will be the needs assessment. So what are the needs in respect of these objectives? And from this, then the member states can set quantified targets on the basis of that needs assessment. And the idea is to design measures for achieving these and also achieving the specific objectives I mentioned in the previous slide. And this should all be done in consultation with national stakeholders. So I know that this has been done in Ireland. We have a good collaboration with our environmental authorities and the NGOs. And I know that this has been done. Um, and then these cap plans have to be sent to the commission and they have to be approved. Okay, so the new words, the European Green Deal, we've heard a lot about in the recent months. And the European Green Deal is Europe's new green growth strategy. And the idea is to transform European, Europe's economy for a sustainable future and to leave no one person behind or no one member state behind. So I'm gonna focus on the biodiversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy, and I'll mention the zero pollution here as well. Okay. So the European Biodiversity Strategy 2030, bringing nature back into our lives. And I think this is very apt at the moment with COVID-19 and with the lockdown. For me, I'm locked down here in Wexford and I'm very, very grateful to be here in the country surrounded by nature. So I think it's a very apt time that this was published. And some of the objectives are to restore nature, protect nature, enable transformative change and an EU for an ambitious global agenda. And the tagline here, Let's take better care of nature so that it can take better care of us. I think it's very fitting given the current crisis. So there's some key targets within the biodiversity strategy that are related to water policy. 30% of EU land and 30% of seas will be protected and a third of this will be under strict protection. Um, restoration of freshwater ecosystems, and then there's a couple of measures in this. So increased efforts to restore freshwater ecosystems and the natural functions of rivers. And this is also an objective for achieving the, the Water Framework Directive. Restoring at least 25,000 kilometers of free, free flowing rivers, and this will include removing barriers and enhancing wetlands and floodplains. And then also the member states review water abstraction and impoundment permits to restore and preserve ecological flows. And this is also a requirement under the Water Framework Directive. And under the CIS guidance, there is guidance for ecological flow. There's also a focus on the implementation and enforcement of EU environmental legislation. So we're well aware that, you know, the Water Framework Directive is not fully implemented and fully enforced. So we want to, to do this more and ensure that this is done properly. Um, 10% of biodiverse landscape features, and finally enabling ac actions to transformative change. And this includes the promotion of nature-based solutions. And these can be very important for many aspects of the environment and not just water. Okay, so that was the biodiversity. I'll now move on to the farm to fork strategy for a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system. And the idea of this is to address the challenge of sustainable food systems. So again, there's key targets in here that are related to water policy. The first one is reducing the overall use and risk of chemical pesticides for 50% and the use of more hazardous pesticides by 50% by 2030. 
This target is also in the biodiversity strategy, so it's quite important. Then there's a couple of um, measures here in order to achieve this target. So this includes revision of the sustainable use of pesticides directive and enhancing the integrated pest management, facilitating placing on the market pesticides that contain biologically active substances, and proposing changes to 2009 regulation concerning statistics on pesticides. So this will be able to give us more information. Another target is reducing nutrient losses by at least 50% while ensuring no deterioration in soil fertility. This target is also in the biodiversity strategy, so another important one. Some of the measures then in order to achieve this target is to reduce the use of fertilizers by 20% by 2050 and to develop in collaboration with the member states an integrated nutrient management action plan. And finally, reducing the overall EU sales of antimicrobials for farm animals and also aquaculture by 50% by 2030. An objective within this to have at least 25% of EU land under organic farming. Some extra additional targets that are also of relevance within the farm to fork. So the transition must be supported by a cap that focuses on the European Green Deal. There's also a staff working document from the commission published on linking the cap with the European Green Deal. And the overall conclusion is that the, the cap has the potential to cover all of these targets within the European Green Deal. So it doesn't need to change. But within this, we have the capacity of member states to ensure that this must be carefully assessed in their CAP strategic plans. So to ensure the targets within the European Green Deal are covered in their strategic plans. The eco schemes in that CAP Pillar 1 offer funding to boost sustainable practices. And the Commission also supports the introduction of a minimum ring fenced budget for eco schemes. So as I said, the, the, the eco schemes are in Pillar 1. So, so some of that budget that the farmers would normally be getting is now going to be in the eco scheme part. Finally, on the farm to fork, there's a part on the farm advisory services. This, I think, is really, really important. There's a lot of research being done and there's a lot of information out there, but it's not necessarily disseminated accurately. When we say farm advisory systems here and we say the Commission will promote effective agricultural knowledge and innovation systems involving all food chain actors. So we need the farm advisors to get adequate education and up to date in order for them to be able to provide correct and accurate and up-to-date advice to the farmers. We need this done in order to get implementation on the ground. If the farmers don't have the correct information, how can we expect them to implement measures correctly? Then also member states will need to scale up support to, for effective agricultural knowledge and innovation systems and strengthening the resources to develop appropriate advisory services. So we need to ensure that the advisory services are up to date on the requirements under the farm to fork, under the biodiversity strategy, and they can give the correct advice to farmers on how they can implement them. Um, also within the European Green Deal, we have the Zero Pollution Action Plan for air, water and soil. This is not published yet, but it's currently ongoing. The scope of this is to prevent and reduce pollution to waters and oceans, facilitate remediation, prevent and reduce air and noise pollution, and prevent and reduce soil pollution, and to facilitate remediation. That's, that's the end of my presentation. And, and just to summarize very quickly, for the CAP strategic plans, it's very important that uh, the agriculture and environment authorities work together to ensure that the correct measures are put into place for implementation. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, if you could please use the conference app and we'll try to address them. Thank you very much.